So, guys, uh, kind of a special little treat today. Editing a bunch of stuff because, you know, hey, coronavirus. Um, but anyway, <laughs> when I was uh, back in Quartzsite, Arizona, I had the opportunity to sit down and have a chat with Ray Novak of ICOM. Ray is a great guy, uh, really has a deep, deep passion for ham radio and everything ham radio. So, uh, like I said, had that little chat with him and here it is uh, for you guys. Here's the highlights. Actually, it's gonna be part, uh, or part of it will be part of a larger video that'll be coming a little bit later this year. Before we get to that, if you haven't already hit the subscribe button, please hit the subscribe button, the like, give it a thumbs up right now, and uh, be sure and check out my Patreon page and or my PayPal page. Uh, you could support me directly by doing that. I really appreciate that. Uh, anyway, here's Ray. I kind of want to keep it more D-Star because I, I get I get this all the time. I, I get the you know. Let's let's let's, let's cover one problem. controversial area. That's kind of what I want to do. The controversial area. I did a blog. It's probably the last blog that I wrote because it just really, the way people twisted it, and another video podcast no. took it and. People twisted your words. Oh yeah, it was. The blog was to educate people. The difference about a protocol that's written around ham radio versus one that's written for commercial use. And I wanted people to know because the new buzzword is code plugs. So a code plug for a D-Star radio, code plug for a DMR radio, do you really know what's inside of it? And most of the people that I've seen that uses the commercial protocols, whether it's P25, NXDN, DMR, uh, I don't know if anybody's playing with Tetra, know what goes inside of programming your radio. Those commercial protocols have certain features that are necessary for a commercial environment. Yes, you get two talk paths on DMR, P25 uh, now is morphing into a phase two, phase three. The key thing is, is knowing what's in your radio. We use the same ch frequencies for multiple agent or multiple, let's use a hospital as an example. We use housekeeping, security, maintenance, all of these, all of these different people that are communicating will use the same frequencies, but they get separated into talk groups. Okay. What do those talk groups really do? In the commercial two-way, it segregates everybody from being able, or not being able to, but segregates them into their own areas to talk because housekeeping doesn't really care what food services is doing. But amateur radio is not about segregation. Amateur radio is about saying CQ and whoever hears you, if they want to talk to you, they can come back. These commercial protocols can stop you from doing that. You also have commands like stun and kill. There's no reason to stun or kill somebody's radio according to the FCC part 97. If you've got somebody interfering with you, you have ways of recourse of that. But to go and initiate a command that stuns somebody's radio because you don't want to hear them? Come on, that's not right. That's not the spirit of ham radio. Two things. The, people say, oh, you're a DMR hater. And it's not that I, I love the DMR concept. I love how you could go from talk group to talk group and I wish it was a lot more interest-based 
rather than geographical based. Right. Um, I don't like the hardware because number one, the radios are built specifically built for end users to change the knob only and not right. get in and play with it. And I don't know how many times I've heard, I hear guys on DMR talking about, oh, my friend built my code plug. Right. And that drives me up the wall because you should, I get it. You should know what's in your code plug. You should know how to do it yourself. You should know that it's a pain in the ass and this is why it's a pain in the ass, but you should know how to, if I come up with a new talk group that you want to join, you shouldn't have to take your radio over to somebody and have them reprogram it. You should be able to do it yourself. What's, what's real funny is you take a look at the cellular industry. How many kids do you think would be paying $1,000 for the latest smartphone if they were controlled and only could talk to a few select people? They can, they can prank dial any number that they ever imagine. Well, with the technology with D-Star, I, the user of the radio, can control where and who I talk to on the network. And yes, there's been fragmentation on D-Star where there's other gateway protocols, and it's been interesting to see where the explosion separated, but now they're intermingling and working together again. So whether it's ICOM gateway software or IRCDDB or some of the others, they are all now coming back together and intermingling. And the features allow you to talk to whomever or wherever you want to talk to. Where on a lot of the commercial protocols, it's where the sysops program what's in this talk group or in this time slot. So the, the cell industry would not settle for it being where AT&T told you who all you could talk to. So, you know, if I buy an ICOM radio, if I buy an ICOM or a Kenwood radio, I'm buying D-Star. But, and I hear people going, well, I want to get on DMR. Do you see in the future um, do you see in the future say, well, you got to talk for ICOM? Well, let, let, me, let me turn this just, just 90 degrees okay. and ask you a question to think about, and your viewers can think about this as well. Right now, the influx of radios that are coming in that are supporting DMR is based on a commercial protocol. Okay. ICOM's introduced an LTE push-to-talk solution, and that's been very successful for us. Public safety is talking about going first net, which is a 5G push-to-talk solution. Right now, they're, they're mainly focusing on the apps and the data that you can do, but before long, there's going to be an app for their push-to-talk and dispatch solution if first net gets their way on doing all of it. What happens when the next new commercial technology comes and the manufacturers that are currently making DMR see their sales plummet and look at the millions of radios they can sell worldwide if they shift to that new technology? Where are you going to buy your DMR radios then? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what you're, you're looking at, that's something to think about, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I talk about supporting the community. Because a lot of these manufacturers that you see with the influx of these radios are not giving back to the community. And they're putting, they're putting the responsibility on whoever decides to distribute the product in the U.S. to handle the warranty. But that's what it's, that's all that it's about is a numbers game. When analog shifts to digital only, when the, the commercial protocol shifts 
And you take a look at it. Why are they not supporting P25? Why are they not supporting NXDN or Tetra? It's because right now, the flavor of the year is DMR. So when you shift millions of product to something else, where is it going to go? And will it be legal to do it in amateur radio? Do you see ICOM in the future supporting multi-modes in, in the digital world? I do not. There's been a lot of money invested in DSTAR, which is the JARL protocol. We're seeing a lot of activity from the JARL for enhancements. And there's more to come from the JARL with DSTAR. And you take a look at one of the largest ham communities being in Japan. Us being a Japanese company, we're going to sit there and support the direction that the JARL is wanting their amateur radio community to go into. And where do you see, for an American market who doesn't really understand the way that the Japanese uh, amateur community has typically used D-Star? Because from what I understand, the Japanese kind of have a whole different way of of doing things than we do here in the U.S. Well, there's there's different rules and regulations that they have. So yes, D-Star, the early years, some of the growing pains were around those rules and regulations. But we saw the JARL help make changes to those rules and regulations. And the first phase of that was the Japanese repeaters being integrated with U.S. root. Now, right now, the only way that you can communicate to them is call sign routing. There are a few Japanese hams that will have some of the third-party devices to get into reflectors, and there's actually some pretty cool experimentation that they're doing to use our new terminal mode and access point mode in from Japan to some of those. And we've seen development on the other side, the IRCDDB, mainly being a European gateway protocol, the developer there also integrated in those two modes to do it. But specifically for, hey, we're here in the United States, we want to do our own protocol, I don't see a whole lot of development other than what Joe Taylor's been doing with F JT65, FT8, FT4 to develop some type of protocol that starts from the United States. Things that I would have loved to see in my 7300, because it does decode RIDI. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to see a CW decoder built yep. in. Um, is that something that is possible as a, as a uh, software upgrade if you guys decide to do it or is it something that you just have you guys have no interest in putting this it's CW it's one of those is it capable of doing it and or will we do it i feel with the firmware updates that we've seen to add features and functionality on icom radio since the 7800 is it possible yes will we do it i don't see that happening i have seen cases where it makes sense. I had a guy tell me where his favorite radio, he sends CW into it and it transmits out PSK31. That's pretty cool. That was very ingenious to do that. But with the direction that we're seeing, especially with the 705, the 705 having Bluetooth in it, having Wi-Fi, today's smart devices that everybody travels with, whether it's your phone, I can see so much being done on the smart device application, much easier, much quicker, and being open source to the open community just by using the Bluetooth tethered to the device. That gets ham radio experimentation at the software level. The part-time soda guy who's about ready to have a heart attack halfway up the hill right. in me says, 
I want to slim my pack down. I don't want to carry any extra weight. And and to have and I was so excited when I saw the 705. Yep. But I you know, not being a strong CW guy, I am pretty reliant on having a decoder built in. But do you climb the mountains without your cell phone? How many, how many of us feel naked without their cell phone with them? I mean, that's, that's what I'm talking about with, with the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth capability. I mean, what you can do with an external device that has so much more memory, that has so much more capability. I mean, the 705, as an example, has the new picture transfer mode in it that we introduced with the 9700. You can take photos of your view from the mountaintop and send it over to D-Star back to home. Hey, you got to see this. You might not have cell coverage to send it, but Simplex with 5 watts D-Star from a mountaintop can cover miles. It's just that, that whole thought of instead of the radio doing it all for you, what, can, what other device do you have? I have not seen the profiles that we will support, but the previous Bluetooth devices that we've supported have been serial, headset, and handset. Now, we have talked about the various other profiles and the benefit on why we would use that, and something tinked over there. So beyond those three primary, I'm not really sure. Now, to think about it, and the developer that likes developing stuff for Android or iOS, when you take a look at one of these small little tablets and the keyboard, you could Bluetooth to the radio and get the frequency out of it. We're doing that right now with the 5100 and 4100. So then you look at, does your logging software support Bluetooth to connectivity? If it does, then there's no wire to attach to the radio. Um, the 4100 and 5100 not only pairs to RVS3, but it pairs to, from what I've seen, it's paired to just about every headset out there that has a push to talk feature. D Star on the 705. Uh, HF capable? Possibly. I've yet to see a functioning radio. We've had prototypes at the Tokyo Ham Fair. I should be getting a prototype when I get back home. A lot of questions will be answered once I get, can get my hands on it to play with. Uh, as far as recharging, uh, recharging the, it, it's got the same battery as the ID51. Uh, no, the ID51 comes with the BP-271, I believe it is. The BP-272 is the larger, the... The double width. The double width battery. That's the one that will be compatible with the 705. Recharging that battery, will that be possible from the USB port while the radio is working? I don't know if it would be through the USB port because most of the USB ports tap out at somewhere around 2.1 amps. I'm not really sure what the charge rate is on that, on that battery pack. Um, I know the rapid charger is close to 2 amps, but that's through the bottom tabs. So to operate and transmit while the battery's on it, not really sure. It's probably going to be through the 13.8, but there again, I could be completely wrong. So we'll have to wait and see exactly what it will do when the radio comes out. That's all I've got this time. Just, uh, well, it wasn't short and sweet. It was, it was kind of long for one of my videos, but I hope you enjoyed it. If you did again, thumbs up, please hit the subscribe button if you haven't and the little bell notification right next to it. And if you haven't uh, already checked out my Patreon or PayPal, uh, please do that. Please consider supporting me. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Bob, K6UDA, and I'm out of here. 7-3.